Hi, it's Steve here from Discover Ministries, bringing you the Hebrew roots of end time prophecy. I've been studying and teaching end times for about 20 years in Bible schools and churches, and one of the traps that I notice students and sometimes even pastors fall into is to mix up uh, the end times with the rapture, uh, to assume that end times in the Bible means a study about when is the rapture going to be. Uh, my channel on YouTube is not about when the rapture is going to be. But uh, for the sake of students and also pastors who invite me to speak, uh, they want to know what is my position on the rapture. I'm going to give you a comprehensive, a complete preview of all the raptures in the Bible and hopefully that prevents this website from becoming a soapbox for people's favorite um, rapture theory and rapture uh, position. Uh, please uh, be friendly towards each other uh, concerning this topic. Uh, let's take a look at what the Bible says, and uh, you're free to disagree. But uh, let's go through some of these slides here. I've got a picture of uh, a saint being raptured. Uh, both Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament were raptured. Um, the word rapture simply means, in plain English, the translation, the physical, bodily translation of a human being while they're alive to another location, usually uh, we refer to heaven. We get translated or raptured alive physically to heaven. So it's not the, exactly the same as uh, the resurrection. Alright, okay, now let's go through the timeline here. These are the most significant events in biblical history, uh, starting from creation right here, uh, Noah's flood, uh, the law of Moses being given, uh, Israel and Judah being a kingdom which got divided and then both of them deported. There's the all essential, the cross of Jesus Christ, the church age, uh, the tribulation which gets divided right in the middle by the mid-trib, and then the great tribulation, this is a period of seven years, and then the new heaven and new earth. All right, we have a timeline there. Let's put some dates there. All right, we've got the beginning of creation, from a biblical account 6,000 years ago, Noah's flood about 5,000 years ago, the law uh, was given around 1,600 years ago right there, uh, Israel and Judah, they were deported uh, at 722 BC and then 586 BC respectively. Uh, the church age started after the ascension of Jesus Christ, that's about uh, 32 AD, and then the uh, subsequent arrival of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the church age has lasted about 2,000 years. You can obviously see this line is uh, not drawn to scale, this timeline. There's the tribulation, a seven-year period, and then the millennium, which is a 1,000 years leading to eternity. All right. Now, what I want to show you is before every single major event uh, in the Bible that we're talking about on this timeline, uh, you will find a pattern. And the pattern is somebody gets raptured. So before Noah's flood, Enoch was raptured. Methuselah died, having been the oldest uh, uh, living man in the world. And then Enoch uh, was raptured before Noah's flood. That's something the Bible clearly teaches. And then uh, I'm just going to go through these quickly, and then we'll come back and explain them with scriptures. Uh, Moses was raptured. Uh, that's how he went up to heaven and saw the tabernacle or the temple up there and came back down and gave the pattern uh, for the Jews to build, to follow. Uh, before uh, Israel was deported into slavery, uh, Elijah was raptured. And then before the church age started, Jesus Christ, our Lord, was raptured. He was physically taken alive to heaven. Of course, there's the Descension of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost right there on the red arrow. And then uh, before this great period called Daniel's 70th week or uh, time of Jacob's trouble, the church gets raptured. All right. During the midpoint of the tribulation, uh, two witnesses are raptured. And then at the end of the tribulation, all the tribulation saints get raptured. So there you have the pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib view. They're all there. In fact, uh, they're all uh, right 
uh, from a certain perspective, there is a pre-trip rapture, there is a mid-trip rapture, and there's a post-trip rapture. It just depends who you're talking to and which group you want to be in. But uh, to me, you know, the end times is not about uh, when these raptures will occur because no matter uh, which side is right, the difference between them is really about three and a half years. And so I'm not really sure why when we're talking about, uh, you know, s the, the history of humanity for 6,000 years, why people are so opinionated and so dogmatic about something that's just, you know, whether you're right or wrong, you're talking about three and a half years, which in most of our lives is like that, you know, it just goes by so, so quickly. Uh, then after the uh, tribulation saints are raptured, then Jesus comes back a second time. He uh, defeats the Antichrist. Satan, the beast, and the false prophets are then reverse raptured. That's uh, my term for them going alive down to the pit and to the lake of fire. Uh, after a thousand years, Satan is released, and then uh, he meets with God the Father. There is a coming of God the Father on the earth, and uh, God the Father defeats Satan. All right, so you see those raptures there. If you count them, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, there might be actually eight there. Um, if you count within this period, there might also be another rapture of the 144,000. Uh, it's debatable. It could be in the midpoint. It could be at the end. Uh, but it seems like, because it's located uh, early in the book of Revelation, it's probably in the midpoint. Um, but uh, there's room for people to to uh, discuss that and debate that if they wish. All right, now let's go back uh, through this timeline and let me give you some scriptures, okay? These are the complete uh, raptures in the Bible. Number one, you've got Enoch, undoubtedly raptured, translated. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's just an amazing scripture. And Enoch uh, is such an interesting figure in the Bible. There's a whole book called the Book of Enoch, which Jude alludes to. And uh, it talks about uh, his rapture, also about the days when the sons of God came down. Very interesting stuff. All right, Moses uh, was raptured. Not many people know this, but let's take a look at the scriptures here. Uh, Moses in Exodus 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called him out of the mountain. In verse 40, God said to Moses, and see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Now, according to Jewish rabbis, uh, many pr uh, prophecy teachers, um, where was Moses taken? According to them, Moses didn't just go up on a physical mountain in the Middle East. He actually was raptured up to the Mount of God, which is in heaven. And we get an indication of this in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 5, verse, sorry, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5. Um, the writer says, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. In other words, what he made on earth is a copy of what he saw in heaven. So he must have been translated to see that tabernacle or that temple in heaven. Another interesting uh, bit here in Exodus 19 verse 13 is the presence of the trumpet. Before the rapture, there's the sound of a trumpet. It's a long blast, and Exodus 19 goes through this over and over, that there was such a long blast that people were afraid. And it says here, when the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So an indication of the future rapture, uh, even in this verse, when the uh, last trumpet of the Feast of Trumpets sounds, they, even the people, not just the leader, not just Moses, they shall come up to the mount of God. All right, we've got Elijah raptured. This is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. Suddenly, a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. That's Elijah and Elisha. They were talking. They got separated by the chariots of fire, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And then Jesus Christ, of course, was raptured. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. 
uh, angel, an angel spoke to the apostles, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. All right, so there's the rapture of the Lord. So we've got at least three clear raptures. Moses may not qualify as, you know, a, a, a perfect rapture in the sense that uh, he went up, but then he came back down and he died. Uh, the other ones, they didn't die. They went up alive and they remain alive. In fact, if you think about it, Enoch uh, may have the distinction of being the first human being who arrived in heaven. Everyone else was in Abraham's bosom or paradise awaiting for Jesus to finish his redemption. But it seems that uh, if Enoch was raptured, that means that he went straight from earth. He went straight to heaven. He wasn't raptured down. He was raptured up. And so was Elijah. So these two had a great distinction because they serve as a model for the rapture in the end time. It's happened before. It will happen again. History is prophecy. History repeats itself. And that's why we study history. All right, and then we have uh, 50 days after the ascension of Jesus, the, um, sorry, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus, 10 days after the ascension, we have the Holy Spirit coming down on the day of Pentecost. And that's recorded in Acts chapter uh, 2, verse 1 and 4. I should say Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And then we have the rapture of the church before the tribulation starts. We have several scriptures for this. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. So God says clearly, uh, this is a comforting message. It wouldn't be a comfort if we had to go through the horrific events uh, that, that are contained in the seven-year tribulation period. He says, no, we're not appointed to that day of wrath, that time of wrath. Um, another scripture, Revelation 3, verse 10. Uh, God promised the faithful church of Philadelphia, because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So there certainly is a promise, at least to a, a group of Christians, that they will be preserved, they will be kept away from this hour of, of trial that comes upon the whole world. That's an idiom for the tribulation. And this also is a scripture where uh, some people might use to debate whether every Christian goes or whether, um, you know, those who were obedient to Christ, uh, saved and obedient, will go. So there's scriptures for both sides. I hope everyone goes, um, but let's not, uh, let's not play around. Uh, let's try to obey the Lord as best we can and be faithful to Him and expect to be raptured among the faithful. Now, this is one of the great scriptures in the Old Testament uh, I believe, speaking about the rapture, I really like it. It's in Nahum, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1. The Bible says, The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. So clearly, God's wrath is not towards his sons and daughters. He reserves wrath for his enemies. So another great scripture that seems to indicate we're not here during the time of wrath. Romans chapter 5, verse 9, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. And this term wrath, you know, gets people excited because they think, well, that, that means it's a pre-wrath rapture. Well, the word wrath, uh, the time of wrath, actually refers to the whole tribulation period. So if you're a pre-wrath believer, then technically you are a pre-tribulation uh, believer. All right, then uh, I won't dispute about all those positions, as I said, because I believe they're all partially right. We have a mid-tribulation rapture for sure. We have the two witnesses uh, who appear and, and, and they preach the word of God during the tribulation, and then they get killed. They had all this power, but then God allows them to be killed, 
and people rejoice that they died. Evidently, this is on CNN and BBC, and the whole world sees and exchanges gifts. But here's the twist in verse 11 of chapter 11. Now, after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up, come up the, here. And so there's a rapture, and they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. This was a public event, evidently televised as well. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and in the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed. A very detailed description of the events of the mid-tribulation. There's a lot of details about the mid-tribulation, but this is very easy. If you're watching this during the tribulation time, and you see an earthquake with 7,000 people are killed, you should fall on your knees and repent and believe in the, the Lord Jesus Christ and, and believe the Bible immediately because this is uh, very, very clear what's going to happen. Uh, there's a, also an ascension of two people in front of everyone. I just don't understand how people don't believe uh, the rapture and, and everything the Bible predicted when it happens right in front of their face. Now, just to touch on a side note for a second, a lot of people wonder who are the two witnesses. There are a lot of good candidates here, but um, let's take a look at who has been raptured. You know, Enoch's been raptured, Moses in a figure was raptured, and Elijah uh, also was raptured. And so two good candidates for, uh, for the two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah because both of them have not yet died. The Bible says that it is appointed unto man to die once and after that the judgment. So Enoch and Elijah certainly could be good candidates. The problem with Enoch though is he's actually a Gentile and he's a very good picture of the the church which is a mainly uh, comprised of Gentiles. So the church gets raptured before the catastrophe. Noah's flood is the catastrophe back in those days. Uh, the tribulation would be the catastrophe from which we get raptured. We escape that uh, time of, of catastrophe. So Enoch seems to be a picture of the church so he uh, to maintain that picture, he should remain uh, in heaven. The other good candidates are uh, Moses and Elijah. Obviously, Moses and Elijah were present at the Mount of Transfiguration, so they've already uh, made some some uh, long distance trips. It would be uh, logical that they would come back. Also, people like the fact that Moses and Elijah, if they were to come back to witness to the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, they would represent the law and the prophets. Moses the law, Elijah the prophets. Uh, that's really great as well. There's one more candidate that seems to get overlooked a lot and um, I just put this out as a suggestion that uh, Elijah certainly is one because it's predicted in Malachi that he's going to come back before uh, the Messiah is revealed to the Jews. Elijah seems pretty set. Nobody disputes that. But another person that I think would really fit the bill well is the Apostle John. The Apostle John has an interesting mention where Jesus says, um, well, you know, what is it to you if I uh, want him to remain on earth till I come back? So it's a very strange illusion. Uh, the Apostle John is also the only apostle who did not die as a martyr. He died uh, peacefully. And so um, he actually asked Jesus, you know, can I have, can I, uh, 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 you know, be baptized with the baptism uh, that you're baptized with, and Jesus says, are you able to take that? It's a baptism of suffering. He says, yes. And so he actually has never taken that cup of suffering, which is to, to die as a martyr. So if John comes back, I think it's a really great picture, um, a great representation for the Jews who are not yet saved to listen to Elijah representing the Old Testament, and then John representing the New Testament. And after all, you think about it, John wrote the book of Revelation. Who better for God to send to explain the book of Revelation than the, uh, the author himself, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I think that's a really good candidate. Again, I'm not dogmatic about any rapture uh, position. I think there's more to end times than, than the rapture. But um, we definitely got two people that are raptured and ascend publicly into heaven uh, in Revelation 13, at uh, Revelation 11, that makes the mid tribulation rapture. Then we have the rapture of the tribulation saints. There's a few scriptures for this. Um, 
The first one refers to the 144,000, we believe, Jewish servants, Jewish ministers, evangelists, if you want to call them that. Um, in Revelation 14, which is uh, just right at the midpoint of the tribulation, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven. So now the scene is in heaven. Revelation 13, the Antichrist was just, you know, revealed. And, 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 uh, and then now 14, there's a scene in heaven. So it's, it begs the question, why is there a scene in heaven? It seems like these 144,000 got raptured at the time that the Antichrist was revealed, at the time that he's about to start the Great Tribulation. Another batch goes up and avoids the worst part of the tribulation. So, and I heard the sound of the harpists playing their harps, and they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne. So there's the location. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. It seems that they were snatched away, translated from the earth at uh, before, before the end of the tribulation. So that may be a midpoint tribulation, may be a... a uh, post-tribulation rapture. I lean towards the midpoint in this because the location is Revelation 14 and there's even another one, Revelation 7, that mentions this group being raptured. It says in, in chapter 7 verse 14, these are the ones who come out of great of the great tribulation and wash their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God. Why are they there? They were snatched out of the great tribulation didn't seem like they, they had to go through it. All right, and then uh, post-tribulation uh, saints being raptured. At the end of the tribulation, Revelation 20, verse 4, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And the post trib uh, people get, you know, this group of people confused. They think it's them. They think it's us. But actually, there are probably millions of people who put their faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. They will see that the scripture has been verified. Uh, Christians were vindicated. They know that there was a rapture. And now they fall on their knees, repent, and put their trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. So there'll be tons and tons of believers in the tribulation. They did not get raptured. So at the very end, some of them were martyred, some of them were beheaded, and they will get translated up and receive their new physical body. All right, another scripture that refers to these tribulation saints being raptured. Matthew 24, often quoted by the post-tribbers, Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Again, this is not the pre-trib rapture. This is not when the church got raptured, because when that event happens, it says it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. No one will see it. But here is a very public uh, dissension of Jesus Christ, public return of Jesus Christ, and he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one heaven, from one end of heaven to the other. So you can see there, there are two groups of people. At the second coming, the angels are sent forth. There is a trumpet. There are many, many trumpets in the Bible. This is not the last trump of the Feast of Trumpets. This is a trumpet of gathering. Right? There are trumpets and, uh, for war, trumpets for gathering and assembling. Uh, the last trumpet at the uh, end of the Feast of Trumpets is another trumpet. And there are also seven trumpets of judgment in the book of Revelation. These are completely unrelated trumpets, different trumpets. All right, so there's a trumpet sound. They gather, the angels gather two groups of people. The elect from the four winds, that refers to the earth, the four winds. And then also from one end of heaven to the other. So those are the people, the saints that were resurrected and raptured before the tribulation. You see there are two groups of people there. So clearly you've got both the pre-tribbers and the post-tribbers in, in one verse. And uh, I just think one day God's going to, we're all going to have a big laugh about this debate that separates us by three and a half to seven years. I think 
every position had some scriptures, had some validity, because there are pre-trip rapture, mid-trip rapture, and post-trip rapture. They're all there in the Bible. There's no need to argue about it. And then the second coming of Jesus Christ, represented by the red arrow there. Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, He is coming with clouds. I don't think that's just, you know, maybe that's uh, vapor uh, is included, but the Bible says that there are a cloud of witnesses. All right, so I believe that's referring to the saints. I'll show you another scripture that backs it up. He's coming with clouds, with us, and every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him, even the Jews. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. And Jude chapter 1 verse 14 seems to identify the clouds clearly. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. That's all of us. We're all going to come together with him, whether we got raptured at the pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. And then, when the Lord comes, uh, there's going to be what I call a reverse rapture. All right, Revelation 19, verse 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and those who worship his image. These two, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. So two human beings are so wicked that they get an early ticket to the lake of fire. Everybody else goes to a detention center called hell, but these two go straight to the lake of fire. And the lake of fire may very well be uh, the surface of the sun. It looks pretty much like a, a lake of fire if you ever look at pictures of the sun. So these guys get sent there immediately. Early ticket. All right? So we can consider that a rapture because it's a physical translation of a human being while they're alive. It's just that the destination is not very, not very pleasant. All right, we also have a, a sort of rapture of Satan. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven having the key to the bottomless pit. This is a different location. This is the center of the earth. Uh, the center of the earth is, is a bottomless pit. It's a pit that has no bottom and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. All right? Satan will get released for a little while. A little while usually refers to three and a half years in the Bible. If you wonder why does he get released, uh, check out my two other videos. I actually put two different videos uh, on YouTube uh, so that uh, people can, can get some possible answers for that. All right? God always has a good reason for what he does. If he says he's got to do it, if he's got to release Satan, it's got to be a good reason. Find out why. Okay, then uh, Satan is released, so he's raptured from the bottomless pit back up to the surface of the earth. This is in Revelation 20, starting at verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive. That's what he does. Every problem in the world comes from deception. So somebody has to get deceived before there's suffering and sin in the world, and he goes out to deceive. But uh, he meets his end in Revelation 20, verse 9, there is a coming of God the Father himself. God the Father will defend the Lord Jesus Christ and defeat Satan in this uh, non-battle. Revelation 20, verse 9, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's Satan and all the armies he tries to gather together to um, fight the Lord Jesus Christ at the end of the millennium. All right, so we have a complete picture there of all the raptures, even the reverse raptures. Uh, Revelation 20, verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast, here's his destiny, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So they've been there for a thousand years and they're still there. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, hell is forever. That's a scary thing. Hell is forever. So we really need uh, Jesus to rescue us from hell. Let me give you a, pic, a pictorial uh, or a graphical uh, summary of what we've just covered. I think you'll enjoy this. 
these are some of the uh, a preview of some of the future events coming up. The Lord is coming to meet us in the air. This is going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. It will happen on the Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of their civil new year. Uh, it usually falls around September each year, so we're looking forward to a September event. Glory to God, an autumn event for the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, he's coming through the atmosphere. Bang, there he is. He meets us, and the dead get resurrected. Uh, this is not a rapture, really. This is a resurrection for those who have already died. But we who are alive and remain, we get caught up to meet him in the air. All right. This is not him coming to touch down on the Mount of Olives and defeat uh, the Antichrist at Armageddon. No, this is the first phase of his second coming. All right. There are two phases. Some people are left behind. Hopefully, if you're watching this video, you'll make the right decision to trust him before you get left behind. After that, the world's going to go through some major catastrophes, some very strange events. We've had a near uh, pass by of an asteroid. I believe we're going to have more. You're going to have more during that tribulation period. Some of those rocks, meteors, bits of asteroids are going to make it down to populated areas on the Earth. It's going to wreak havoc on this planet. Um, there's probably going to be a nuclear exchange in the Middle East. That's coming up. That will fulfill the Ezekiel 39 cleanup. There's an Ezekiel 38 war uh, in which Israel soundly wins. And then there's a cleanup of some radioactive material. Read that in Ezekiel 39. It's a 3,000 year old prophecy before nuclear weapons were invented. God knows everything. Uh, there's going to be a tabernacle or a temple built in Jerusalem. Uh, it's a speculation that it's going to be on the Temple Mount. It, it, it can be. It might be, it might not be, because whether you build it, uh, even if you could build it on the Temple Mount, um, the Orthodox Jews would still consider it defiled because there's a, a Gentile monuments uh, next to it. So it may be an Old Testament type tabernacle where it's a movable thing and it's somewhere where the Jews might consider clean enough to, to uh, offer sacrifices. It doesn't matter where it is, it doesn't matter uh, whose theory you follow, the Bible says there's going to be a tabernacle, and that's going to get defiled by the Antichrist. Um, the Jews uh, are going to receive two witnesses that are going to be mighty convincing. Like I said, it could be Elijah and John representing the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, that would be uh, awesome. They're going to come and they're going to preach. And they're going to do signs and wonders. And unfortunately, they get killed, um, and they'll get raptured three days later, thank God. Uh, Jerusalem and Israel are going to go through a hard time. In fact, if you're watching, when you see the Antichrist defile the tabernacle, setting up the abomination of desolation that Daniel talked about, Jesus said, flee, get out, get out. There's a place in Petra where the, the rocks will you know, hide you and keep you safe. And uh, the Lord Jesus will keep you safe. During this period of time, um, a lot of people are going to be deceived. Uh, the Bible says that you know the beast and the false prophet are going to they're going to work signs uh, by which they will deceive those who receive the mark of the beast in their uh, hand or in their forehead, uh, by which, you know, this mark, they, they, they say, if you don't receive this, you won't be able to buy and sell. And, uh, and then some people worship uh, the image of the beast. Uh, so many people won't believe that this is really a, a, a dangerous thing to do. Don't do it. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Don't follow the Antichrist. Don't follow anyone who pretends to be a hero. Follow Jesus who came for you. God came for you without sin. He lived without sin. He died without sin. He died for our sins. But uh, unfortunately, many people won't believe that. And, and uh, so many people will be lost. And that's such a tragedy. You know, the Bible says the, the, the gate to uh, the way to hell is wide and uh, the, the way to life is, is, is narrow and it's difficult for people to find. But uh, thank God, John said, at the end of all that, now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, a white horse, and he who rides on it is called the Word of God. He's the living and true Son of God, and uh, he'll come. He'll come for you. If you believe him, even in the tribulation, he will come for you, and it won't be that long. 
So you've got to endure. He who endures to the end will be saved. That will be the toughest time to be a believer in the Messiah. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced. Zechariah predicted. He predicted that those tribulation saints will see his nail-pierced hands, his nail-pierced feet. They'll look upon. And some of the Jews, they will ask, One shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He still calls every Jew his friend, even though he was wounded. You know, there's no, no deeper wound than to be wounded by your friend, to be betrayed by someone close to you. And that's what the Messiah suffered. He, he suffered that. He understands if you've been betrayed. Now he said in Mark chapter 13, See, I have told you all things beforehand. But these things, John said, I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Right? John records Jesus saying he wants us to know the future. He told us the future so that you'll remember. You saw this video, you heard the word of God, you'll remember. It happened according to what the word predicted so that you know there's only one true and living God who knows the future. His name is Jesus. His name is Yeshua. If you want to become a Christian, all right, it's simple. To become a Christian, you must repent of your sins and then pray a humble prayer to God. Here's an example. You might want to pray this right now with your own lips, loud enough that you can hear yourself and God will answer. Make sure you're rapture ready. Make sure you're rapture ready. If you missed the rapture, make sure you get in the safety of, of salvation. Uh, make sure that you're ready to meet the Savior when He comes back to rule and reign. How you do that? Just pray this prayer. Pray this prayer with a humble heart. Say, Dear God, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe Jesus is your Son. He is sinless. And He died on the cross to pay for everyone's sins, including mine. I believe Jesus conquered death and the devil and rose again on the third day. Jesus, please be my Lord, my Savior forever. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you prayed that prayer. God heard you and he answered you. We're going to see each other. If not up in the air, we'll see you, we'll see you in heaven. All right, God bless you.